Thank you for choosing to listen to this message. At Coastal, we believe in changing and enriching lives through the power of the Word. We pray that this sermon would be a blessing to you. ...and allow you to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And he says, well, I'm Bill Seidel. I'm a retired airline pilot from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And St. Peter, you know, goes through and checks his list, and he kind of has a little smile, and he says, here, come over here. Take this, this nice silk robe and this golden staff and come and enter into the kingdom. So he puts on his, this nice fancy robe and takes his nice staff, and off he goes. And up next, it's the minister. So he stands there and proudly says, you know, I'm Joseph Snow, and I was the pastor of St. Mary's for 43 years. And again, Peter, you know, goes and, and checks his list and says, all right, you know, come over here. And he brings out this nice, simple, plain cotton robe and this nice wooden staff and hands it to him and says, okay, you can enter into the kingdom of heaven. And the minister says, well, wait, whoa, wait a second. How does, he was a pilot, how does he get all the nice stuff and I'm over here with just these simple things? St. Peter replies, up here, we were five results. When he flew, people prayed. But when you preached, people slept. <laughs> so, yeah. So hopefully my preaching doesn't put you to sleep, and hopefully the flying I have this week doesn't make my passengers pray, because that would be bad. Um, so this year, I know the, the focus of Coastal has been on the next generation. And I, last time I, I spoke, what I spoke was really more for everybody. It wasn't really focused for the next generation. Um, but today I want to speak on something that it, uh, I believe affects the younger generation more than the older. However, it applies to everybody. So just because you might think, oh, I'm not part of the next generation or I've done my time or whatever you want to think, it definitely applies to you. It applies to all of us. Uh, so don't fall asleep on me because I don't want to end up like that pastor in heaven. Um, Lord knows I need help dressing myself. Don't make me wear a <laughs> don't make me wear a cloth robe or a, a cotton robe. Um, so what I want to talk about today is on accepting responsibility and taking ownership. Yeah, whoa, I know, super serious, right? You should see the PowerPoint I created for this. Yeah, you'll laugh because it's like two slides. Um, so as a note, I'm not talking about official leadership capacity. You know, you are the official leader of this. I'm just talking about in your individual life, whatever that looks like, answering to the people around you, whether, you know, your family, your job, or just taking care of yourself. Um, so yeah, this, like I said, this applies to everybody. And a uh, little opinion alert here. This is my generalized observation here. This is my opinion. But I would say that most people my age and younger tend to avoid responsibility. Um, again, I, that's my opinion, so don't hold me to that. Or if you don't agree, you know, we can talk about it after. Um, but I've seen that just in you know, my own personal life and other areas. You know, some generalized observations, I would say. Would, you know, people, and again, this does really apply to everybody, but we want things given to us without having to earn them. We want to hold others responsible for our own actions, our own decisions. You know, it's, it's not our fault. It's everybody else's fault. Um, you know, one thing that always comes to mind, and I, I'm not saying this is 100% of the time the case, but I, just in my own, the people that I've seen and, and things like this, um, I think a lot of times abortion is they want to have sex, but don't have to have the baby. You know, they don't, you know, they don't want the responsibility that goes along with that thing. Yeah, not every time, but I see that. Um, then there's the, it's not my job mindset. You know, you see the picture of the guy painting the yellow line along the side of the road, and there's a stick, and he just goes around the stick. You know, it's like, you know, that kind of mindset. You know, just on the bare minimum to not get in trouble or not get fired and, and things like that. But you kind of get the point. I don't really want to focus on that today. Instead, what I want to focus on is the example that Jesus sets for us. Because I think there's a really awesome example there. Because there is a situation. We, his creation, had screwed up. In case you have never heard this, we, had, we sinned. And what that did was that separated us from God. We no longer could be, you know, in, well, we could communicate with him, but we couldn't be close to him. You know, we could not have a, a great relationship with him. Um, and he didn't cause that separation. We did. You know, that was 100% on us, right? He's up there in heaven already, sitting next to Jesus, and he's perfect. He still is. And he had no requirement to come down to this earth and die for us and take the, the blame and the responsibility for our sins to end that separation and allow us to, to once again be with the Father. But what did he do? You know, he came down, he took the responsibility, and he sorted out the issue. And if you've never heard what I'm talking about, guys, 
Jesus Christ came down from heaven. He came to this earth. He became a human, and he died a terrible, terrible, awful death to pay for our sins so that we can forever have a relationship with Father. Not just, oh, you get to go to heaven one day, but right now, in today's time, we can actually connect with the Father and have a relationship with him. And really, our heaven starts starts now or starts whenever we, uh, we accept that. And the way you accept that is you have to believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead. And the Bible says you shall be saved. And if that's all new to you, it is amazing. And let me tell you, it will change your life. It'll change your eternity, and that's awesome. But guys, it'll change your life starting today. But now this wasn't Jesus's problem necessarily, right? He's up in heaven. He's perfect. Um, but let's look at what he did. He came down to this earth, and now we're going to get to the night he was betrayed. In a, in a few minutes, we'll put some scripture up, but I'm going to kind of talk about it first. Um, the night he was betrayed, he knew what was going to happen. He knew he was going to be beaten, tortured, essentially. He knew he was going to die the most painful death that they knew how to kill somebody in those times. I mean, this was a very, very painful death. And what he did is he went off and he prayed. And this is what he said. Now, what I'm this is part B of a verse. We'll get to part A, but first I have to show you part B. So if we could pop up Matthew 26, 39, and again, this is part B here. There we go. Jesus was talking to the Father, and he says, yet not as I will, but as you will. So what he does in that moment is he accepts the responsibility. He says, okay, if this is what you will, I will do it. You know, he puts that on his shoulders, and then he followed through. You know, he went, he went to the cross, he died, he went down to heaven, took the keys, and then was resurrected by God. Essentially, there was a problem, there was a solution and he decided to act on it, you know, and that's, I feel like, the example that he sets for us. You know, he didn't sit there and say, well, I mean, they screwed up. Let them sort it out. I mean, that's, the, that's what I want to say, right? It's easy because then you don't have to get involved. You just get to sit there and watch them, you know, run around in the mud trying to fix their own issues. Yet he knew that there was a solution. He knew that he could do the solution, so he did it. He took that responsibility even though he didn't have to, I would say. You know, it wasn't his. He wasn't the cause of it. But that's the example that he set for us. Um, now, I also have a bit here about motivation. This is along the same lines, I guess maybe point B of this whole thing. I'm not going to speak for long today. But we hear a lot, and I hear a lot about people, they want to be motivated. Like, they have Motivation Monday, and you know, it's all the, I see all these things about how to stay motivated for them to work, get up early and work out, or how to eat healthy, or how to do this. And they have all these tricks almost, you know, just so that way they can be motivated because they're not motivated they're not going to do it um but i have to say i don't really think jesus was very motivated about the idea to go to the cross i would not say he was excited about it if you just want to look at the motivated or not motivated category i think i would put him in the not motivated category um because and remember that that verse is part b in a minute here we're going to read part a and let's actually let's go ahead and look at that. Let's look at part A of that verse. It says, And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. He literally asked God if he really had to do that. I mean, he's actually asking to get out of it. I mean, I would not say that sounds like a very motivated person. I mean, he's trying to not, doesn't sound like, oh, hoorah, let's go do this, right? Um, but what did he do? He did it anyways. And to me, that's a big part of what it means to, you know, man up or woman up in life. You know, men, uh, men's eternity, first rule, of the four steps of being a man, one is accept responsibility. I'm sure Sam, all the other guys have been through it, uh, they agree with that. Now, I'm not here to say that motivation is irrelevant. You know, it's, I'm not saying that at all. And Jesus... There, there, he was motivated to do this because he did love us, and he did love the Father, and out of that love, he wants to do what he knows is best for us. But in the moment, man, he did not want to do it. I mean, it's really easy to say, I love you, I will make every sacrifice for you, and you can really truly mean it. But then when crunch time comes, you're like, oh, do I really want to do that right now? Um, and I would say in that moment, I mean, he literally asked God not to do it. And if you actually – I didn't put it in here, but if you keep on reading just a couple of verses later, he again a second time – asked if he can get out of doing it. I mean, he's really trying to check with God. He's like, I know you told me this, 
but I don't want to do it. Can I not do it? And then a few minutes later, I say, hey, I just want to make sure I heard you right. Is there any way for me to get out of here? No? Okay. Then I'll do it. So I'm not saying motivation is irrelevant or anything like that, but I, I would say go make it the top of your priority list because motivation comes and goes. It's cold or out. Who likes the cold? Who's loving the cold weather? Anybody? Yeah. Everybody's dressed up in their warm clothes. Yeah, Mike Bear's really loving it. You know, if you want to go outside and run and you wake up and it's like this, you may not want to go do that. You know, your motivation might not be there. It comes and goes. <laughs> Rachel's in big agreement with this. Um, so this is a little more of my opinion here. I, but I would say if you're motivated in a good way, awesome. Use it. Use the motivation. Um, but at the same time, don't allow motivation to affect you negatively. I guess a lack of motivation. You know, don't be like, well, I just don't want to do it today, so I'm not going to do it. I would say motivate or not, if you know you need to do it, you got to get up and go do it. And I would even say there's no secret because people say, well, what's the secret? How do you do that when you're not motivated? I just say you just get up and you go do it. I mean, there really isn't much of a secret here. Um, and again, this little section, again, is more of my opinion, so please don't, you know, search for scripture. It may not be in there, but I would say that that's part of a sign of maturity. So, you know, those of you, I don't have kids yet. We have a dog, which, you know, I and Jeff, Jesse would definitely say is our little child. Um, sorry, I'm not supposed to talk about grown-up grief, but love you, Jesse. Um, yeah, I'll be in trouble in the drive home. It's okay. Um, you know, a child is going to pout and throw his toys when you tell him to clean up his room because he doesn't want to clean up his room because it's not fun. That's being, you know, essentially it's responsibility, and he wants to do what's fun. But an adult is going to clean up because they know they need to clean up. It's just they don't need to be motivated necessarily. Like, well, I need to clean up because I do. Um, and then if you really want to go to the extreme, and I would say this doesn't apply to everything, but in, in small ways I would even say if there's something that you're not motivated to do, do it and then do more. Just to you know, kind of beat the flesh down a little bit, maybe train some discipline in your life You know, to say, hey, you know what? Just because I'm not motivated, that doesn't. Why is that going to control me? Why am I going to let my emotions control me? You know, if, if you have to do the dishes but you don't want to, maybe do the dishes and then sweep the floors. And then Jesse's laughing because I never sweep the floors, but I do do the dishes a lot. So now I have to start sweeping the floors again because um, she knows I never do it. Sorry, baby. Um, and that's a, and again, you can't apply it to every situation, right? But I don't know. And that's kind of my opinion here. But I think it's good to train ourselves to where we're not run by our feelings. Feelings are important, but we can't allow that to dictate what we actually do in our life all the time, especially in areas of responsibility because, guys, responsibility isn't fun. There's always something fun that pops up. I mean, how many times when you have something to do, have you cleaned your whole house? Just because you don't want to have to do that responsibility, even though cleaning the house isn't fun, you'd still rather do that just because you want to avoid the responsibility. Um, yeah. So, again, that's just a little example, but you can apply that to – many situations. So how I think this all actually applies is I want to challenge all of us, including myself. I've been doing that, you know, aka cleaning the floors. You know, I've been looking at myself as I've been putting this together just to look around and look at areas that we may be shirking responsibility, that we know God wants us to actually carry some. And it could be simple things like cleaning and doing chores, or it could be, you know, responsibilities to your spouse, to your children, or to just your family in general whether it's at work or school, maybe taking care of your health. That's one for me. I like to not eat very good. Um, you know, that's an area where I'm shirking sure responsibility. Or maybe it's more important things like serving in the areas that God wants you to serve or talking to those people about Jesus that you know he wants you to talk to them about. You know, those, those much more weighty areas. Um, but whatever it is, I would say do... Start off by doing two things, and then we'll finish off with doing a third thing. The first thing is, you know, ask Father if that's really what he wants you to do. Don't just sit there and think that, well, I just, I'm just going to do this because I think I should do this. That's not a good place to be. But ask Father if he wants you to do it. That's what Jesus did. He asked him twice just to really make sure. Um, but ask Father. And if you think you should do it, I would even say go and, and find a spiritual father and mother that you trust and talk to them. Because I, well, too often I say people, they have this phrase, well, God told me to do this, and they run off and go do it, and they never talk to another soul about it first. And I think that's kind of a dangerous place because I'm not perfect. Hate to break it to you. 
you guys aren't perfect. You might, you have no idea. I mean, you have some idea, but you really need to check and make sure that what you're thinking is is really in line. You know, there is wisdom in the counsel of many, right? And I think that if God's Spirit has put something on your heart, and you go to a spiritual authority in your life and talk to them about it, it's the same Spirit. And if it's truly something, I think that that Spirit's going to confirm it through them. I know, I know, Dave and Carol aren't here, but there was one time where Dave, you know, he, the man that preached last week, he's walked all over, all around the world. There was a time he wanted to, he thought God wanted him to go walk somewhere. I don't know where. And he submitted it to the five other couples that really, you know, hold him accountable in life. And one of them, who's actually a doctor, John Stoltz, came back and said, I don't think you should do it. All the rest said, I think, good to go. We have peace with it. One out of five came back and said, Dave, I just don't have peace with this. And he said, you know what, because that one man said he's not at peace, I'm not going to do it. And within a month, I forget what happened, but he had a major medical event. And if he'd have been out on the road in you know, the third world country, he probably would have died. But instead, he was home, he received medical care. And it took a while, if I remember, it took many, many months to come back to health, but he eventually came back to health. That's just a little example. You know, I think we have to be careful about just saying, well, God told me this. Because then you're, you know, yeah, you, want, you do want some confirmation here. So those are the two things. Ask Father, and then check with someone that you trust that's spiritually mature. And then the third thing would be, well, do it, right? But I would say, you know, start small if this whole thing is kind of new for you. Think of it like running a marathon. You know, you're not just going to run a marathon day one. You've got to start off small. You've got to slowly work your way up. So don't sit there and think, oh, I have to go crazy now and accept every responsibility I've ever thought I might, you know, need to. No, just start in the little areas and work. You know, God will honor the, the small things and, and grow them into larger things. But just do something. I like to always remember that it took Jesus 33 years to fully fulfill the reason he came on this planet. And he was Jesus. So you may not want to think you can do it in a week. It took him a long time. So don't go crazy with it. Just make progress. Just, you know, it's not how fast you go. It's just as long as you're moving forward. Just little bits. That's all that matters. Now, if you're part of the group that believes, man, I got that. I got this whole responsibility thing down. I, you know, I, I accept responsibility that I need to. I carry the responsibility thing. Then great. That's awesome. I'm glad. We need more people like you. Um, but remember, I do think this applies to everyone. And you may be thinking, well, if I already do it, how does this really apply to me? I would say, and I'm really speaking to myself because this is my own, this is how I personally find myself is, uh, we have to be careful not to look down on those that aren't carrying the responsibilities that they should, because that's a very that's a poor attitude. And guys, a little secret: it doesn't help anything. You know, it's really not helping, and all it does is give me or us a bad attitude. So if you if you find yourself in that situation, I would say instead let's take responsibility, which you just said you were good at, to teach and equip those people. To help them take responsibility, not do it for them, not to say, well, I can just do it, so I'm just going to do it. You just get out of the way because I can do it. Not that, but teach them and help them and encourage them and say, hey, you know, let me be your sounding board. You need advice, come to me. Let them do it, the responsibility that is on their shoulders, but help them because, again, to grow, we need mentors. We need people, you know, in front of us. If you have been doing this for a while and you carry responsibility, great. You have a lot of wisdom and experience. You have a lot of things that are very useful. Don't just die with it all in here. You know, help others around us. I think as a church, we need a lot of that. You know, we need to be able to carry responsibility out in the world so that way people turn to us when the bad things are happening and we can be in positions to influence people. So, so all this is just some food for thought. I promised you, I told you I wouldn't speak for long, so I didn't. Um, but it is a pleasure to talk to all of you, so I'll turn it over to my dad here in a second. And I really hope that I got all this in the right order and that today's message causes you to pray and that my flying tomorrow doesn't because that would be bad. But thanks, everybody. Thanks, son. Would the worship team make your way back up?